first, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello, everyone. This is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thanks for joining us. We are live streaming here from the Fox 12 Oregon newsroom, as we do every weekday, starting around 1 p.m., going throughout the afternoon, and we get to cover a wide range of topics and have some great discussions here on this show as part of it. Today, we're having one of those. We're talking about humanoid robotics. Yes, you have seen, I'm sure, a lot of videos, and one of those videos that you've seen online has to do with Digit, a humanoid robot that is actually from a company here in Oregon, Agility Robotics. That's what we're gonna be talking about here today. We've got the co-founder and chief robot officer, if I have that correct, uh, yeah. Jonathan Hurst. Fantastic title. And uh, Jonathan, you know, thanks, thanks for joining us here. I'm excited to talk about this just because this is such a, such a cutting edge thing, but also the local aspect of it too is really incredible. And, and I think for everybody out there, if we could start off, if you wouldn't mind giving us just a little bit of the history of Agility Robotics and how it really got started to begin with. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it started at Oregon State University. Um, I came to uh, kind of start up a robotics group and a robotics program in 2008. And it was very much a science problem at the time, so very appropriate for university. And, you know, when I got there, I said, hey, when we solve some of these science problems, we're going to want to start a business. And Oregon State's attitude was, how can we help? So all along the way then, if we built a whole robotics program there, and it's, which is thriving. We solved a bunch of the science problems, and then we spun out Agility Robotics in uh, 2015. That's really amazing. So, this, so Oregon State actually helped you start this business on your own. Oh, absolutely, yes. So several of the uh, patents and things like that we did at the university first uh, with graduate students and everything else. We licensed that technology when we founded the company and uh, have a whole agreement with the university. I'm continuing to uh, collaborate. Uh, Alan Fern is my collaborator there. He's taken over directorship of my old lab while I'm here at Agility Robotics. Uh, and we continue to work together. That's amazing. So, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty great story, Jared, just from Oregon State helping that. So something that you started there, learned, they help mm -hmm. guide you on this, and then you form Agility Robotics. So t tell us about Agility, just as a company itself. Sure, so look, when this was at the university, it's a science problem. How does walking and running work? How can we build a robot that can go where people go and move the same way that people do? Once we kind of solved that, at least to the core piece of it, we said, okay, now, um, what? how can this have real impact, direct impact? How can we make products that will provide value to people now that robots can go where people go? Because that's a new thing. You know, robots used to, there's these bolt-down robot arms, there's the wheeled robots, but you still have to design your whole environment around them. This is the first time robots can just exist in human spaces. So there's a whole new set of businesses that are going to grow out of that. It's People are starting to recognize the scale and the scope of that market. It's bigger than the automotive market to have humanoid robots out there doing useful things in the world. So that's what Agility Robotics is focused on. And one of the key ones there happens to be your robot uh, Digit, I believe that's if that's the correct name there. So Digit, can you tell us about this particular robot and sure. you know just a little bit of that origin story maybe of Digit and just where you're growing? Yeah, I want to be like Digit is, I would call it a human centric robot. And the purpose is to have it be multi purpose and do lots of useful things in human spaces. Now, it ends up looking a little bit humanoid, but the fact that it looks a little bit like a person is more a result than it is a goal in and of itself. So, we're not just trying to make a robot that looks like a person. We're trying to build robots that can go where people go and do useful things in human spaces. Um, we looked at just literally hundreds of different use cases, some of the first use cases for the robots uh, that could really be a business. And the right match for the technology and the, the market is going to be just picking up totes and putting them somewhere else. Even in this video, you can see the, the, sh the shelf of totes. We do, we do lots of demonstrations, technology demonstrators, like here in this video, we just said, hey, Digit, clean up this mess. And you know that's connected to a generative AI that interprets what's going on in that world and makes decisions about what to do. That's a really cool demo, but what makes money is just pick up those bins over there and put them over there. Pick up the bins that are coming in off of the AMR and put them on the conveyor belt and do that all day long. Um, so that's a good, call it the beachhead market. The, and this is it actually, right here. Digit is picking up these bins off of the uh, autonomous mobile robots, the wheeled robots bring these bins up and Digit just unloads them and puts them on the conveyor belt. Does that all day long. That solves a problem. That's a thing that's very hard to hire people for because it kind of matches the, the dull and dirty, if not the dangerous part of uh, the classic 3Ds of robotics. So it's, this is the starting point on the way towards Digit 
you know, depalletizing and unloading tractor trailers and sorting and moving boxes and things and eventually getting into things like retail and grocery stores and stocking shelves and someday uh, getting into our homes and actually being a robot that helps us in very general environments. So you're seeing really this robot eventually progressing to all of these different fields. Looking at yeah. it right now, when we're talking about it, it seems like more kind of an industrial setting, um, industrial slash commercial setting. Yeah, I think the beachhead market, the very first thing to do are these industrial settings. It's a little bit more controlled, you know? This is the first time we have robots around people that are balancing, they're standing upright. And so it's possible for the robot to fall, right? And when they have a failure or something, and you have to be safe. Safety is like, the main barrier to getting these things deployed. And it's as hard to figure out safety as it is to figure out all the other grand challenges in robotics. And we're we're really tackling that. I want to point out like our robot digit, it's the only one that's commercially deployed. We've we've moved over 300,000 items for GXO, and we're the only company that's done anything like that. And we're the only company that's going to have a functionally safe robot, and that's a technical term because it goes through a certification process such that insurance companies understand the risk, and we can deploy this robot at scale in warehouses uh, coming out next year. Uh, so when you have that kind of safety, you know we have OSHA and we have you know all, all these different uh, organizations that will understand that. That's the path that we can understand safety well enough to get it to be in the home. But Interesting. you know until you can until you can prevent the robot from until you can prove the robot's never going to fall on a baby, it's not going in homes. So it's just a long path to that. That's that's a good good reference point there. Yeah, worst case scenario, yeah, fall on a baby. So, uh, yeah, until until you prove that that it can't, that makes sense. Um, looking at, you know, you mentioned that this is deployed currently. Um, yeah. I think I believe you said GXO is is u utilizing this, and mm -hmm. you mentioned this one next year. So with the the one coming out next year, what are the I guess changes to this one or the iterative oh. improvements? Yeah, have. so I mean, one of them is a big battery technology change. Our battery is going to charge in like seven or eight minutes then for a two-hour battery life. So that's huge, you know, a wow. super fast charge. It's unbelievable how much current gets dumped into this thing. It's a big thermal challenge. Um, another one is, is that functional safety. There's 360-degree cameras that are a whole combination of like infrared and, and, and regular cameras to always identify people. It's a safe, certified human detector. So the robot can then take some action if a person's coming close to them to ensure that it wouldn't injure the person. Um, there's a whole strategy around that. So that's the functional safety piece. Um, it has its own you know, charging station, it self docks. It has uh, tool change mechanisms for the hands. You know, People use tools, of course, but we're kind of constrained to using our hands to pick them up. But with the robot, we can design our own interface to the tools. So. Digit can use all kinds of different tools, and including dexterous manipulators and other things. Um, when you look at the, I mean, there's the mechanical side, obviously, and the physical side mm -hmm. of this, but oh, yeah. talking about generative AI, with the yeah. rapid improvements of that, how have you seen that change, I guess, your approach to robotics, and how quickly do you think that can expand the, I guess, the potential of these? It's a really, really big deal. And, and you know, it, it sounds like hype, I think, but I, I mean, there's a huge core of truth to a lot of the hype here. Um, it's just people are rapidly figuring this out. So think of it as the semantic intelligence, which is like ChatGPT or Gemini, uh, where it's like a chatbot and it's very smart. It can tell you all kinds of things about what's in a room and what to do. So that's now just available to us where it just was never, you know, robots couldn't do that before. So we can ask Digit how to, you know, bake us a pie and we're going to get the set of instructions on how to do that. The whole other end of it, though, which Agility has been doing from the beginning, is the physical intelligence, as how to actually grasp and turn a screwdriver, or how to actually pick up something and, you know, cut it with a knife. We probably aren't going to give our robot knives, but, you know, <laughs> baking a pie, that's the analogy there. Um, but the point of the physical intelligence, how to walk, how to grasp, how to do those things in the world. And, boy, all the, the reinforcement learning in simulation and then transferring that to the robot, then gathering the data from the robot in the real world so that it can learn over time. Uh, it, that's definitely the future of how controls will be done, and it wasn't really feasible for us to do before, I don't know, five years ago. There's a nice yeah. video out there of, of Cassie at Oregon State um, running a 100-meter dash and getting the Guinness World Record for that, right? And that's among the very first times that anybody has done a learned policy on a robot for balancing and dynamic behaviors. So, I mean, the potential just seems to be endless with that. What are, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face with this? Um, I mean, safety is the big one. It's, yeah. it's such an unknown. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to like, what are they, there's that, uh, 
Uh, you just have to pick the small piece of the problem and keep making progress on it. Um, but it's a really big one. Uh, I think the fact that it's physical hardware is another one. You know, it's relatively easy to build a software company and scale it because if there's no real cost, it's just adding another million customers. But, but with physical hardware, there's a whole lot about every one that you manufacture and every one that you deploy and every one that you service. And now it's a fleet of robots that you're managing and tracking. There's a lot there. It takes quite an organization to do that. Right, and you mentioned you know more potential maybe even than vehicles. I think is something that you said at the beginning there that this could oh, be a bigger I, industry yeah. than that. So you know, if you look at what um, you know, various agencies are starting to, the, um, or the analysts are saying about this, and other venture capitalists they'll say it's a thirty-eight billion dollar or a seven trillion dollar market. But I think the one that is easiest to compare, the note Kosla said, the humanoid market will be bigger than the automotive market in twenty years. It will be having a greater economic impact in the automotive market in 20 years. And I think um, that's realistic. And when you when you talk about that, I just, I'll bring this up because I'm sure somebody will ask this. When you talk about the economic impact and having that many humanoid robots out there, do you anticipate that, you know, when it comes to jobs, is this something that's replacing humans or are um, doing something that could, you know, assist humans in workplaces like that? I, I see it very much as assist humans. It's, it's you know, it's still a machine. Um, and it's just like any number of other, uh, you know, uh, labor saving devices that we've been inventing over the past 200 years that across the board has increased quality of life. Now, we do have to be careful in how we do it and how we implement it. And we need to be careful about, you know, how does this affect society? And a lot of this is going to be, um, you know, policy and government policy about when, when robots eventually are going to do all labor. Um, you know, what does our economy look like then and how do we make sure people are cared for? Things are going to change. We're going to have to really rethink a lot of stuff to make sure this works. Yeah, and that's that's on the way. So I think you're right there. The government policies and just rethinking how we how we look at mm -hmm. things is definitely going to be important. Um, going to the business side, just really quick, you know, uh, what is it that encouraged you to stay in Oregon for Agility mm -hmm. Robotics after Oregon State? Um, you know, it's just, it's a... I mean, a number of things. One, I love living here, uh, just personally, but also other people do too. And, you know, we have people who would come and just be ecstatic that there's a high technology company working on the most advanced robotics in a place like Oregon. And they don't have to go to Boston or to San Francisco in order to do that, because not everybody's a city person like that. So it's a really good place for us to catch a lot of people who are very talented. Um, another thing I would say is just it was a, you know, Industries and companies thrive where they are seated, and we were seated at Oregon State. And you know, I started the company, but then my students are coming over and and joining the company. And people have roots here as we start to build and grow. Uh, and you know, that's continues to grow here. Now we do have offices in Pittsburgh. We started with an office in Pittsburgh because of our Carnegie Mellon connection, uh, and we are opening an office now in the Bay Area in uh, San Jose. So we're going to grow where the, where the talent is, and um, that will continue. You know, we have remote workers as well, but we'll always have an Oregon home. Um, for, for everybody out there, just to understand, you know, agility, what do you think is the most important thing they should know about agility robotics and just the future of humanoid robotics in general? Uh, and if I, humanoid may be the wrong term, as you said there with Digit, but in, in general. It's good shorthand, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's fine. Just... It's real. Like, I'm not, I'm a professor, right? And so giving a talk somewhere, if you say something that's not true, you're going to get absolutely shredded. And, you know, we're not the kind of Silicon Valley where you really want to just sell that vision and sell that future. We're kind of selling the future, but very rooted in reality. And I just want to be really clear with everybody that this is going to be a huge deal. We're in this inflection point where soon we're going to have robots that are like this in our workplaces and in our homes, and it'll never go back. It'll always be like that going forward. Um, labor is central to our economy, and robots are going to be doing a lot more of that over time. And um, let's just make sure that Oregon is part of this economy of the future. It's a really important, valuable thing. Seems like we really are on the precipice of that, you know, one of those big technological changes, you know, whether it's cell phones or computers or, or wh whatever it may be, yeah, but something that's, that's going right. to change. Change this is big like that. This is big like that. So let's lead. Let's be part of it, right? Let's have. Let's participate in this, and help in setting the direction. 
Well, talking about that direction, I do have one last question for you. You know, digits employed in these industrial settings and soon to be commercial settings. How far out are we until I have my own personal digit robot that can do my laundry and wash my dishes for me? You know, I think it's going to be more than a decade before we have robots that like that can be in our homes because of the safety questions. Even some of the like, how do you make sure that say the robot's doing your laundry? How do you make sure that it doesn't do the laundry when the puppy was in the dryer, you know, or something weird like that. People just have so much common sense from so many experiences, and we really need to get to the point where robots are better than people at uh, being safe like that. And there's there's a lot there to figure out. So let's take our time. Let's go through industrial and, and commercial and, you know, gradually work our way out then into, into homes. I, your description right there makes me absolutely happy that's what we're doing. So yeah. don't, don't rush it, but it's going right. to come soon enough, it seems like. And you know what? It's many multi-billion dollar markets on the way. So there's really no reason to, to try and make that jump. I don't know. It's pretty exciting. It's an exciting time to be in robotics. It really is. Well, and, and just awesome to just go back to the fact that, you know, it's here in Oregon, as you mentioned, why not lead? This is what's happening. And uh, we got you all here doing that. So, Jordan, thank you very much for having some time to have a conversation with me about this. You know, it's really fascinating stuff. I love learning about this and, uh, and really exciting just to see where this is going. And as you mentioned, this is happening. So is anybody happening. out there who, who wants to be a star, it's like, oh, no, I'm not ready for it. Well, this is this is it. And so it's important to learn about it and understand it. And uh, and have that communication from you. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you for having me. This was great. Um, and for everybody out there, I will say this too, just for who wants to learn more about agility, what's the best place for them to do that? Oh, contact our, I, I don't know. It's a good <laughs> Sorry, question. I just do that out there. At the end. Okay. I, we'll say go to the agility website. Um, well, yes, yeah, certainly. Let's go to the agility website. We've got a lot of information there. And you know, we, we post on social media as well. So we can see on YouTube, we've got a ton of videos. I'd say, go check out YouTube. We've got a lot of videos of our robots and what they're doing. They really are fascinating. Well, Jonathan, thanks so much. Uh, go Beavers, and, uh, and thanks for being go here on the show. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. And for everybody watching, again, this is Fox 12 Now. We get to have these longer form conversations. We're going to take a quick break. We've got plenty more coming up here throughout the afternoon. So make sure to download that Fox 12 Oregon app. Great way to watch this show and everything else that we do here uh, as part of that for these conversations we get to have. But I'll talk to you soon. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox.